are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Good old Donald J. Trump back in the news, uh, uh, leaving his crimes aside for a second, has been ramping up his talk of a Muslim ban and other kinds of bans on immigrants. You know, once upon a time, I wrote uh, during the first uh, campaign of Donald Trump, a presidential campaign, about the fact that fear and hatred of the stranger, the outsider, the migrant is nothing new in American culture. Uh, and I quoted uh, this from a book, uh, from, a, from a great novel. It, the sentence is, and the men of the towns and the soft suburban country gathered to defend themselves and they reassured themselves that they were good and the invaders bad as a man must do before he fights. Uh, these people, uh, these men described in this story, uh, were fighting immigrants from Oklahoma. It was describing the residents of California. It was in John Steinbeck's great book, The Grapes of Wrath. My next guest, historian uh, Harvey J.K., has reread Grapes of Wrath. He's been telling us uh, he's been telling me personally how much it's meant to him. Uh, it's, I'm certainly overdue for a reread, so I thought that would be a good jumping off, well, we thought it would be a good jumping off point for a conversation. So without any further ado, Harvey J.K., welcome to the uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. You know, I have to tell you, Richard, it's funny. We, we've only known each other maybe several years, but I have this feeling like we're, we're old friends, okay? Yeah. And especially because yeah. I'll give away, you know, the behind-the-scenes story that... Um, you and I spend always, I think every time we talk, we spend about 20 minutes before we even begin to record catching up, right? And, and, and of course, the humorous part of that is Troy, who's the man behind the scenes, um, always threatens to uh, record that and, and, and blackmail us. I'm making it public, Troy, in case you decide to do anything about that. Um, but seriously, it's great to see you. And, uh, and I guess happy birthday is in order for you. Well, not yet. Let's not jump the gun. Um, <laughs> a lot can happen between now and August 23rd. But, uh, yeah, okay. And uh, listen, so uh, you're a historian, uh, like most people of, I would say most people of our inclinations and uh, generation, you've read Grapes of Wrath probably when you were quite young, as I did the first time, and you told me you have reread it. Uh, I gave a little hint of how I kind of vectored it into the present a few years ago. Uh, what's your takeaway rereading it? Well, I, first of all, let me say that I had read it inadequately years ago, meaning I sort of picked it up, stopped, picked it up. And it was the kind of thing where probably I had been assigned it in high school by what I thought was the best English, one of the best teachers I had in high school. And I, and I think that I kind of, skimmed i think i read it fast I, that i couldn't spend that much time and in contrast however to moby dick melville's great novel which fascinated me and i never finished grapes of wrath i had decided some time ago i would like to look at again because i had chosen grapes of wrath as one of the four movies that I used on an evening where I co-hosted Turner Classic Movies back in 2018. Oh, okay. And I had never, and I had, I didn't reread the novel in favor of the film. I just watched the film and I, and it, the film itself blew me away. But this time, and I've been doing some stuff with a podcast coming out of Lever News called Movies Versus Capitalism. And I did a recording recently with them on Newsies, the Disney film because as i always tell people how could you not want to watch newsies it's one of the only films that come out of hollywood where the where the workers win or at least don't lose and and of all things it's a musical on top of that and imagine disney which was never known as a friend of labor at all no no not at all is the produ was the producing studio anyhow so and we've pretty much agreed that we'll do another one soon on grapes of wrath well I thought, you know, maybe this is the time I should throw myself into the novel. And, and I thought, can I make it through the novel? And what I didn't realize is that I just couldn't, in some ways I couldn't put it down, but I also knew I could never binge on it like 24 hours. 
So I started ass- assigning certain times of the day that I would read it. And one of the things that's astounding is that the detail that Steinbeck affords, and I mean, real detail about individual actions, about the, the situation they found themselves in, the Joes, that is, I didn't find myself wanting to skim at all. I thought the, that he was so effective in taking me into that world and into that terrible journey that they were experiencing. But I, I read it, I, I, and as soon as you started that quote, I, I, could, I remembered those words. And the other fascinating thing, in case people are, haven't read it at all, is that when I was write, writing my Thomas Paine book back in the early 2000s, and then, of course, my FDR book on um, the Four Freedoms, I went back to Grapes of Wrath strictly f- to grab hold of things that I knew were there, things that were there. And some of the stuff was not in the narrative chapters. They were in the, what do they call them? The, the, in, the in, interstitial the chapters. chapters that, yeah. Interstitial chapters. That's a good way yeah. of putting it. Thank you. And those chapters, and then that, what you said, I think, comes from one of the interstitial chapters. I could be wrong. That's the sense I, my recollection. Those chapters also, are so revealing of Steinbeck's politics, you might say, along and then and it affords the narrative chapters all the more meaning. And it's interesting that that he was anti-Marxist, Steinbeck. Right. Okay. However, you you wouldn't know that because you really understand the, that the way he sees the California that he grew up in in the 30s now is clearly a Marxian understanding of it, that this is class war. And he even talks about the Joes as part of this great migration from Oklahoma, and thus, you know, the, the derogative Okies, that, um, that that itself portends a kind of possible revolution, that, that it'll transform California in a way from the bottom up. I mean, it's, it's a really, it's just a, such a dynamic book. It's astounding. I also came to realize, I would be reminded that the film and the book are different in that the the film ends on a on an upbeat note. John Ford, the director and the writer, whose name I just blanked on, I just read it his name. But anyhow, they wanted to give they wanted it to reflect the possibilities, reason to be hopeful, you might say. Whereas mm-hmm. Steinbeck doesn't he the only thing he f- leads you to believe re- reason for hope is that he reveals the humanity of people and the solidarity that that's possible but he doesn't leave you with a sign of real hope in the in that moment anyhow so but i just i'm, I'm going off a little bit on it. i just found the book absolutely extraordinary i i do believe i'm not the first person to say this and it probably has to be the best novel in american literary history it's got to be the best novel i mean and it's also the case that it was banned in any number of communities back in the third when it came out in the thirties in the into the forties and remained banned in many places. And some people said to me that it remains one of the most banned books in the states, though it's not on the top ten list. It's banned still in, in lots of places for its language, the sexuality, the class representation of the property. Um, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I just, it's probably banned in Florida, or they'll get around to it. The I. I I just I don't get into like best lists or anything because yeah, right. you know there are so many different rich veins of material everywhere. But uh, you know I, I think I told you the other day, Harvey, that uh, on one, Facebook or somewhere where it says you know we're supposed to some social media where they say where do you live? I answered wherever uh, there there's a fight, so hungry people can eat. I'm there wherever cops are beating up a guy the uh which i remember mostly i don't even know if it's in the book in those words uh that's what uh henry ford is tom jode says uh, you know at the end of the movie that he you know and that was the uplifting i guess ending for the movie that even though uh the uh, jim casey character had died that uh he had quote in today's language raises the consciousness yes. of right of the protagonist tom jones yeah joe did so we think the struggle will go on but i don't know if that dialogue is even in the book do you remember well the one where he's talking to he's telling his mother yeah he's telling his oh, mother yeah, that, that he's leaving yeah oh it's there oh yes absolutely mm-hmm. but it and it that is 
That's when he's about to leave. When he's when he he can't right. stay. The family will be in too much trouble if he gets caught. And it, and it's a right. and in fact that that's one of the by the way and that is one of the two or three phenomenal quotes. It's it's a powerful quote. I will tell you back when I worked on the Thomas Paine book, the the quote that really I loved in, in good part because it was the proof that Paine had never been forgotten. I was that was one of my d- goals in writing the Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. In the book, in one of those interstitial chapters, Steinbeck writes this, if I can, if you'll allow me, I, I had to open my book to remember the, the, you know, I can't remember it by heart. Sure. If you who own the things people must have could understand this, you might preserve yourself. If you could separate causes from results, if you could know that Payne, Marx, Jefferson, Lenin were results ah. and not causes, you might survive. But that you cannot know, for the quality of owning freezes you forever into I and cuts you off forever from the we. And no, that's, it, go ahead. Are you, uh, I mean, that's the quote. I mean, to me, I mean, it was just very powerful as a, I mean, in spite of his ant- antagonism towards Marxism, I think it had to do with the fact that he had no, no love for communists in the 30s. But it really is a statement it's very, of that divide. It's very socialist, and by the yeah. way, it also reminds me that my social media bio for Twitter reads, my pronouns are we and us. So, uh, you know, it's, so that's fascinating because that's a collectivist uh, thinking of the, of the left of that era, and uh, I'm intrigued by that. Also, given the fact that he was anti-communist, I always thought that final scene where Tom Joe tells his mom he's leaving, it sounds like he'll never be back, but um, that uh, he's going underground. I, I always read that as being he's becoming a revolutionary in effect. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, that's he, yeah. he's now going to, he's both going underground and going out, coming out, you might say, politically and in terms of his labor unionism. Just, we made that reference to Casey. Casey had, been, of course, was a preacher in the in the prior to the novel, and in the novel, jo- Tom Joad is coming home from prison. He, he had killed a man in self defense, but of course he spent time in prison, and he runs into Casey early in the novel, and he remembers him as the as the preacher, and Casey remembers him, and Casey says he can't be a preacher any longer, and he confesses to all of the women that he that he slept with but it wasn't just that he that somehow he had discovered there's something there's something missing in all of that and it's in the course of the confrontation with you know the, the what would be the the mob the, the 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 growers representatives who were line aligned with the troopers and the sheriff's people gets he gets killed and that's the, and that's when of course jode literally has been as you said, in many ways, been influenced by Casey's own realization, and it makes connections. I mean, Joe, you can all the, way, all the way along, he's clearly contemplating and contemplating, and he's desperately trying to make sense of things. And that's that critical moment where Casey gets killed, and he instinctively responds, and then comes out of the instinctive to realize what's at stake and what he needs to do. Yeah, it's really something. Um, the book itself is, to me, in many ways, it's, there's so many different themes, but one of them it ha- actually has to do with solidarity. At first, it's the solidarity of the family and the mother holding, you know, holding that, that family together. But of course, along the way, the journey out west from Oklahoma to California, people leave. The solidarity is is, is not as the mother would have hoped, you know. For, right. One member, well, they leave in part by dying, but they also leave the that their daughter in the in the Jode family is pregnant, and her husband, who's who f- fancies himself capable of going out and, and making something of himself, he just essentially leaves one day off. He just goes, and you never hear another you know anything from him. Then one of their sons, who's not the contemplative you know possibly university student that Tom Jode might have been, Noah I think is his name. He just but he realizes that. He needs to go, that he needs to find himself and the family will be better off not worrying about him. And he just walks down the river. Okay. I mean, there's a lot, I, there's a lot of imagery, of course, that takes you back to the Bible almost, but it's the case that 
the solidarity still holds around the mother and her husband and i guess it's the her brother or the husband's brother and the daughter is still there and these two little kids so it's it's the solidarity there but eventually the mother herself well she does it early on but in the film she says it at the they move this quote from early on to the end of the movie in the, where they want to give you hope and that's when she says basically we're, we're the people we're always in other words we're going to persist and we will always be here as if they they could knock the crap out of us but we're going to persist um and it's the we're going to persist right that's that's almost her understanding it's more than a matter of the family it's a matter of a larger solidarity and you know the there everything all the travails you're describing of the family is it's as if they've been displaced from paradise right you know that uh, the sort of rustic community life that had been stable for so long and suddenly they're thrust out of it into this different world and it's harder to maintain that cohesion and of course you know steinbeck's biggest novel i guess uh, was east of eden which is you know also interesting in that sense uh i'm wondering you know uh, i know that uh in trying to sort of tie the messages of it both uh, anchor them both in the period when it was written but also when it, it, it you know uh, the period we live in now uh, I, as i mentioned i uh i wrote a piece right after trump got elected uh, November six, uh, November seventh, it was published, twenty sixteen. Uh, that's when I wrote this piece uh, 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 called "We Were All Outsiders in Trump's America Once," even Trump, because German Americans, yeah, were once, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, were very much the target of the national security state, as we call it now, during World War One right. under Wilson. Uh, so we already had this experience behind us. I didn't know until I researched that piece that within six years of the dust bowl uh refugees from oklahoma made up nearly 3.5 percent of california's population and uh of that of course they were concentrated in certain areas salinas you know central valley and yeah. so on so it was an enormous infusion uh a dislocation uh, on a major scale and i'm wondering if you know how that resonates with you well, in terms of go yeah, ahead. no no indeed in fact it re resonated with me in contemporary terms and i kept thinking about it that to read this is to try to come to grips as well with the horrors in many ways of the refugees from syria and the refugee well, you know the experience of being a refugee and these people were themselves americans that you know right. who had come off the land within the united states um and had come out west and they were viewed they were they were they were viewed and I, i'm not going to use the term i think it comes up in the book i'll just use the b word black they were viewed as no different than blacks in terms right. of the racism of the of that moment um but and and so you know i thought about that a lot it's interesting the one thing that doesn't show up in the novel itself is the, is the degree to which uh he mentions mexicans along the way but it's he doesn't talk about how the in quotes okies are perhaps displacing mexicans and filipinos in those in those fields um in california so there you know that that part is there but it's all if, if we know enough to to recognize that these things were, were part of that moment um something else that, that i bring up is two things well one in particular that it is already an, a time in which the government has provided certain kinds of camps and i don't mean just hoovervilles there were hoovervilles and those were nightmare situations but there were camps and the camps the government-run camps were were kind of like utopias in california and they actually did op many of them operated exactly as steinbeck portrayed it and i'll explain that in a moment he actually got close to the one of the supervisors of one of the camps and came to understand how these camps were run so you arrive at the camp and you're and, and only so many can be accommodated so if you arrive and there's nowhere for them to to, for, to situate you and your family you were basically sent down the road to the hooverville which basically was subject to harassment and could be readily and many were burned out 
mm-hmm. to drive you know the refugees or migrants away but in these camps these were basically like socialist okay they were self-governing operations mm. yeah so that you anarcho-socialist almost if they were self-governing right yeah well so the, the the manager's job was to or was to basically to at least in the in the case that uh that steinbeck's friend as manager had or supervisor they had so there were different sort of sections of the camp and each section would kind of like cuba back in the days of the revolution each section would elect a committee okay and they were by the way they were women's committees and the women's committee then would would send people forward to a, a camp committee and this and these women's committees also were were like you know the welcoming committee if a new family came and that they would explain the rules to people and the rules were very democratic very egalitarian and by the way there were hot hot and hot and cold water facilities to shower there were places to do laundry they had saturday night dances but at the same time they were there they were very well organized because they knew that the outsiders would try to infiltrate and try to create a ruckus possibly you know a fight inside right. because that would enable the police to have reason to come in otherwise they were not allowed into these camps the only, and and there was a, they even had a, a a store on the site you know a shop on the site and you could you were given like an upfront credit okay and i think there was little expectation you would pay it back however you had to share in the work of the camp like maintaining the fences cleaning the roadways through it i mean it was a very kind of collective thing but you didn't get paid necessarily i guess by being in the camp that that's why the men would often have to go out and look for work which was hardly available anyhow it's i mean there was just this film is and so you know rich. that the 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 camps the, the, what you're describing about the camps makes me think of there was a small book written by the uh left-wing philosopher g.a cohen which i'm sure you've read i believe it was called why not socialism or oh, something yeah. like that I, I haven't read it but i do know it yes well it's lovely really but what he does is he takes he says he, uh, when when let's say two families go camping and they bring their tents and all that the natural organization that they create for themselves is socialism they figure out who can do what who has why yeah. they share their skills they share their resources and so on and that and from there he argues is kind of a natural default position for humans not this alien thing imposed from above that it, its opponents suggest and there's something of that in that story you're telling of the camps um on a on another note, Harvey K, let me uh, juxtapose two quotes for you. One is from Donald Trump in 2016, uh, and Donald Trump said the following, I'm sure you recall, quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, end quote. Oh, sure, yeah. From, from John Steinbeck, The Grape of, Grapes of Wrath in 1939, Quote, they said those goddamn Okies are dirty and ignorant. They're degenerate sexual maniacs. These goddamn Okies are thieves. They'll steal anything. I mean, the, the symmetry is almost, to me, almost shocking. It's almost like, uh, it's uh, almost as if something in the, uh, in the social DNA of the country uh, has persisted. But what's your reaction? Well, to but I two? was well. Steinbeck, I think, in another place in the um, one of those interstitial chapters, talks about does talk about the ways in which the, the owners divide people. I'm I'm pretty sure, as I recall, yeah. the, the divide people and how how they can use that. And in fact, this is so. For example, it, this has to do with class and race. Maybe these were maybe the folks. Maybe they didn't realize what they were. At one point, they're told there's work picking cotton. And so they, they leave. Actually, they leave the government. That's right. They leave the government camp because they still have no money. They've gotten to the point where they have to go find work. And they hear that there's, you know, up the highway, there's a, a place to go. And they get there because they're promised a nice rate for picking the cotton. Yeah. Okay and when they unless it, there's also the apple indicate story but i think this is con and when they get there 
they're they're escorted in by police. Huh. Okay, and why? Because there are strikers just outside uh, yeah. of the farm, and when they and they they are there, and they find out, they find out that uh, the, that they these folks had been getting that rate of pay, the ones who are on strike. But uh -huh. that the very next day, they were cut in half the the rate, like per per sack, and they warn them it's going to happen to you too, and it happens, and uh -huh. and the division. In fact, may maybe that was the case. Maybe these were Mexican or Filipino strikers. I mean, I, I'm just projecting into this. So they find ways of dividing them very effectively, and I think also by telling these you know by telling the working class in california you can growers themselves portray these folks in certain ways on the one hand they're doing everything in their power to recruit them to california because they want to lower the rates of pay even more and then they get there and of course they're propagating the argument that these people are of this sort but of course i'll never forget sorry i'm going a little astray here i'll never forget that uh that moment in the play Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw, when um, the father of, I forgot her name, Eliza Doolittle, comes to the home of the colonel and the professor and asks, where's my daughter? And the, eventually the argument gets to the point where he says, well, if, if you're going to keep her here, how much do I get for that? Right. And, uh, you know, Colonel Higgins or the, says, Oh no, it's a professor, right? Professor says, "What kind of morality do you have? What what kind of values do you have?" And this man, who's probably a, a chimney sweep, says, "I can't afford morality. I can't afford values." Okay. Well, in the case of these folks, yeah, they were they, there were things along the way. Steinbeck doesn't portray them as saints, okay? Right. And, but they but were trying also, to survive. They're, and, they're having to survive, right? So on the one hand, they are saintly in the in their solidarity, but they also know there are times where they're going to have to steal or fight or whatever else. So, and when it comes to the growers and the way they are able to uh, raise anger and violence among lower income people yeah, yeah. who already live there. That to me too is also resonant of you know MAGA Americans. Here's another quote from I believe it's one of those interstitial chapters. <clears throat> the local people whipped themselves into a mold of cruelty. Already were in MAGA land. Then they formed units, squads, and armed them. And then yeah. he describes that. Then he says, "We own the country," meaning these. This, that's what the mobs think. We can't let these Okies get out of hand. And the men who were armed did not own the, own the land, but they thought they did. In other words, you know, they're being manipulated, right? They don't have anything, but they think they're defending that land that they don't really have. That seems to me to be very uh, apropos for the present day, too. Yes. And in fact, I'm glad you brought that up because there's, if we think about the two ends of the, this geographical journey, Oklahoma and then California, these Okies... There are two things driving them off their lands. One is the fact that there's a Dust Bowl. This is the time of the Dust Bowl. But they were already living basically right. close, what they say, close to the bone or whatever the, the word is. Um, and many of them were, in fact, sharecroppers or tenant farmers. They didn't own right. the land, but they had been there for generations and they saw it as not unlike peasants in fact i think the word peasant comes up at some point in the book as this is even if they didn't own the land that their very lives were rooted physically in this land and then of course what's interesting is there's that moment in the book and it's an interstitial moment i believe and they and in this case the filmmakers 20th century fox studios i guess they actually took that and put it into the movie as a narrative moment it's that moment when the bank representative comes out and tells them they've got to leave their leave their land okay they're finished and and the and the man um which is i think Dooley or something like that is his name and he says to the he says well who do i see you know and it eventually gets to the point of who do i shoot 
Okay. Right. right and he right. said, you know, and, and, and the guy, the guy says, well, it doesn't pay to go to, to the bank in town because they're just trying to, they're just answering to the bank. But eventually he gets, well, who the hell do I shoot? Right. It's like, right. Are, you know, who am I? And the point is that it's, this anonymous capitalism almost kind of kind of thing but they know they've lost their land now they get to california and the point is that these folks these poor white folks many of them had come to california at some time in the past and had land and in fact lost it to these growers who have accumulated right. literally feudal estates basically and at one point in the novel they when they at one point in the novel, Tom Joad gets lucky. He, if, by way of another guy in the camp, there is a job where he's going to get paid decently for for a couple of days, and that's a small independent grower who's not a member of the association, you know, of the of the big growers. Uh -huh. And he says, "There's only so much I can do. I don't even know how much longer I'm going to last. They're going to, I'll, you know." He knows the writings on the wall, but he hasn't lost it yet, so he doesn't hate these people. Uh -huh. So it's this it's this very interesting juxtaposition. This is why it's funny that that Steinbeck is not funny. It's serious. I mean Steinbeck is really is this whole idea of property as this assault on solidarity and the imperative of solidarity to to res as the way to transcend it, it, it to me it's kind of just fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating as you say, you know, quite Marxist, really, and it's one of the things that fascinated me about that line about they did not own the land, but they thought they did. Because, of course, you know, under socialism, the land would belong to them. And, you know, what he got through, this land is your land. And, yes, you know, yes. Right. You know, this land it was made for you and me, not those other guys. You know, people, well, we all learned that song in school without. The verses that talked right. about yep you know how private property is theft and all that and uh, to me i'm also by the way fascinated because of my interest in music with the fact that some of the children of these oki immigrants became country singers and songwriters and immortalized their perception merle haggard you know yeah. mama's hungry eyes kern river um there was a great songwriter named dallas frazier who wrote a song called california cotton fields that describes the families moving out everything we had he said everything we had was either sold or left behind from from daddy's plow to the fruit that mama canned some folks came to say farewell or see what all we had to sell some folks just came to shake my father's hand you know i mean there's a yeah so there are you know uh, you know so merle sang about the, the the labor camps and you know so you have this sort of generational inheritance and yet the grandchildren now of and great-grandchildren of the elkies in many cases are replicating the behavior that yeah. was directed against their ancestors just as the people doing that to their ancestors were replicating the behavior probably to some extent that was taken against them so uh, there's a cycle one becomes aware of yeah right? and you know and the only way to ever transcend all of that is if we had a decent political party that could literally rally people <laughs> that could literally you know i mean you know i assume that the, the basic impulses and values prevail it's the fact that who gets to is a question of whether or not they're going to be engaged and harnessed and if they're not then you get the likes of uh of a trump and right-wing republicans reactionaries who are going to harness it for you know and pervert the values okay you know we're going to defend america okay or this is a, a matter of liberty right and our freedom and all that it's the perversion of exactly and i and i think that i think steinbeck gets at that in those interstitial chapters yeah yeah no i think so too I, now you're going to make me go back and read it you're not going to make me i mean you can't i'm going to make me. you i am a but professor <laughs> <laughs> i will go back and read it so well this has been uh refreshing and different and really fun so thank you um harvey jk a professor emeritus at the university of wisconsin and and my good friend uh and advisor to marianne williamson for president thanks for this this walk through history and history via culture and great talking to you well, for thank out. you i have been i have been dying to it's like just within me i wanted to talk about it even if i hadn't thought it through thank you very much
All right. Um, and we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.